Um, I'm going to talk about political advertising transparency as a framework of response um, that has emerged uh, that has emerged in response to some of the issues that have come up around social media and elections. So political parties have always advertised on different kinds of mass media, but more recently, um, these days we also see on social media platforms there is a lot of propagation of election promises, of uh, posturing, and so on, and simply understood. Um, Ads on social media are essentially content that the advertiser pays the platform to circulate more than what it would normally circulate. So in this talk, I mainly focus on Facebook uh, political advertising, which is also quite um, prevalent in the Indian uh, political uh, context. So what is different or what has changed from earlier forms of advertising? Now, there, um, Without making it sound like it is like social media is exceptional in that kind of um, way, that because even when it came to newspapers and so on, there was always this question of how um, advertising revenue would influence editorial choices and so on. So not to make it super exceptional, but to just understand what is different when it comes to social media ads. Um, that what you see on the left now, for example, is one of the um, advertisements one of the campaign ads uh, of the BJP around the 2019 elections, where it is essentially, even in the content of it, targeted towards first-time voters and talking about how data is cheap under um, Modi's government and so on. Um, so typically what we encounter is a video or a photo um, with a hyperlink that leads outside and maybe a slogan and so on. Um, but what we don't end up encountering is uh, what you see on the right, which is um, the the political advertising transparency data from Facebook about this ad. So it goes into a lot more detail about who ended up seeing it, what was the demographics, what was the um, gender, for example, or the regional distribution of the people that saw the ads. So this is kind of what is not very easily accessible um, for a viewer. Mm -hmm. Now, in 2018, after the Cambridge Analytica revelations, uh, where basically it was revealed that an analytics firm used Facebook products to build uh, water profiles and target users, essentially just do um, just use Facebook in the way that it was meant to be used. So Facebook had to res respond to this kind of public reckoning with their platform. And, um, and that was the moment in which political advertising transparency was offered as like, a solution by Facebook. Um, so in other words, I'm, I'm trying to say that it's important to locate political advertising transparency as a response that emerged as a PR move, as a damage control and a marketing move by the largest marketing platform in the world. So I'm going to um, now look at um, the problematics with political advertising as a category and with transparency as um, the response. Now, transparency is something that is available only for ads that are classified as political. And the politicalness of ads is determined by Facebook by looking at uh, two kinds of things. One, either who is creating the ads, or second, what the ads are about. Now, before, of course, going into the question of who gets to decide what is political, the very fact that all of these ads circulate in targeted or optimized for engagement kinds of ways arguably makes all ads on the platform inherently political. Um, but in any case, Facebook essentially carves out this neat category of political ads um, by creating this kind of binary between uh, commerce and advocacy. So it says that all ads that are commercial in nature are not political ads and therefore transparency data will not be available about them. Whereas all advocacy related ads will be considered political and therefore there will be um, some uh, higher degree of information to read about it. And now, um, <clears throat> yeah, so it sounds like basically like a recipe for willful ignorance, but in practical terms, this is how it plays out. So on the screen you will see um, an ad by Shell that talks about um, more trees, read how nature can play a vital role in the fight against climate change. Um, 
I'm not sure what that means. And basically on the right, you have like um, a community organization talking about uh, encroachment um, in forests and so on. So the one on the right is of course classified as political and the one on the left is not. Um, there are just for some more examples, basically a merchandising kind of company that talks about Black Lives Matter would not be considered political. Um, but a Black Lives Matter group that talks about um, COVID restrictions in schools gets classified and so on. So basically it is in Facebook's interest to keep the numbers of political ads low as the demands for its transparency and therefore intervention into Facebook's advertising infrastructure remains uh, minimal. And in a in a US Senate hearing, I think in 2020, Zuckerberg uh, admitted that less than 1% of the firm revenue is from political ads. Of course, in that context, he was trying to say that, um, um, so, so it, I think it was in the context of allowing for misinformation within political ads or something like that, uh, to say that they are not doing it in the interest of uh, monetary benefit that actually political ads make up for a very small percentage of their firm's revenue. But I think what that also reveals is that um, it is in Facebook's interest that, that actually Facebook is only classifying 1% of all of its ads as political ads. Um, okay, so yeah, and in India, basically there are all kinds and all levels of campaigning that happens. Um, and, and there are so many actors that straddle these kind of easy binaries between commerce and advocacy. There are um, uh, outfits like news organizations that, that on the face of it have a news facade that end up doing different kinds of campaigning. There are booth level entities and groups and all kinds of things. So to adapt political ads as a relevant category of governance, even when we're talking about social media, um, I think is uh, um, is something that I think is a bit questionable. And now I'm going to move on to why transparency also, in fact, might not um, might actually distract from what might be needed as a governance response. So since 2019, Facebook has been providing um, certain tools through which it seeks to provide more transparency. And one of them is the Facebook Ad Library API. Now this is, uh, the, we use the Facebook Ad, Li Ad Library API at um, the AdWatch project and basically collect um, data about political ads. Um, now there are a number of issues about the accessibility itself of the API and the kind of verification procedures that one needs to undergo in order to access it, but I won't get into that. I will just go in a little bit deep into the parameters of data that are available and actually like where those fingers are pointing or what actually that data reveals. So on the left is just like an image of um, a snapshot of the JSON format data that um, I captured. So the syntax or something is kind of maybe helpful. And on the right is um, most, sorry, on the right is some of the parameters of data that um, are available. So the ID, it starts with the, I mean, I'm starting here with the ID, which is basically a unique identifier for each advertisement. The ad snapshot URL um, leads to the creative, that is the visual content of the ad when you click on it. The ad creative body is the text that accompanies a particular ad and link title and link caption have to do with any hyperlinks that you put on it. So this is mostly like um, infrastructural in the sense of creating a different identifier for each ads and things like that. And the second group is essentially the time at which an ad was created. And of course the time at which it was created is different from the start and stop time. Cause I can say, I can create an ad today and say like only um, started in February and so on. Uh, and then there is the currency in which the ad has been bought, the funding entity that has bought the ad, the page unique identifier and name, the publisher platform. So like this um, Facebook advertising infrastructure is not just limited to Facebook, but also it's um, family of products that is like Instagram messenger, as well as audience network. Audience network is essentially um, uses Facebook advertising infrastructure 
to serve ads outside of Facebook products. So if you have a, uh, I don't know, an ad in Practo or something like that, they can, for example, use audience network for it to serve ads on Practo. Um, and finally, the language in which uh, the ads are created. So the second kind of paragraph or the second group of um, parameters are essentially, you could say, are advertiser choices, whatever the advertiser has done or is identified with and so on. Now, the what kind of seems to be juicy information of demographic distribution and region distribution is actually a bit of a, um, well, the demographic distribution and the region distribution essentially tells you the outcomes of the targeting process. So it's not necessarily what the advertiser intended, but what actually ended up happening. So I could, um, as Greenpeace, create an ad and be like, uh, serve this ad about, um, uh, I don't know, disappearing um, mangrove forest to 10 people. And if those 10 people only happen to be uh, young 20 year olds, that is a decision that the um, that we can see with this data. So it's not necessarily revel revealing anything about the platform ch choices or even about the advertiser choices, but just the outcomes of it. And finally, um, the three parameters in red is in the form of a range. So the transparency data is not um, is not one number, but it is a range. So it would be like zero to 100 rupees has been spent to reach 5,000 to 10,000 people and so on. And the relationship between spend and impressions, I think is the most um, is the most important or like the most revelatory kind of thing that Facebook provides, but also in the form of a range and not really in a specific way. Um, so all of this to say that in totality, if you look at what is actually being revealed. This is not so much how or why I received a particular ad or how or why an ad was received by a particular person at a particular time, cho chosen from like millions or billions of ads that might be running at that particular moment. It only points towards advertiser choices and not much about the platform. And as more and more um, advertisers outsource the job of defining audiences to Facebook. So earlier what used to happen was some years back, there was a lot more targeting to say that, um, I don't know, target young mothers in the region of Bangalore, for example. But now with, with uh, Facebook's advertising infrastructure getting more sophisticated, often what a lot of advertisers do is just to say, here is X amount of money. I would like to reach Y amount of people. How you do it, what determinations uh, happen there, is none like they don't bother themselves. The advertisers don't bother themselves with that information. So this kind of optimization that Facebook does in choosing the most optimal ad for a particular person to see is a decision that um, still is is very much as much of a black box, even in the presence of all of this transparency data. And to that extent, this kind of data might even be like a distraction from the from the actual um, important stuff. Um, so yeah, compare this with what a Facebook advert, um, Facebook um, president of ads, I think said, VP of ads said, that there are close to 2 million data points um, that go into the determination of why a particular ad reaches a particular place. So that is, if, if that is the degree of data crunching that happens with um, ML models and so on, is transparency the response or is, is even, mm, is this, uh, I don't know, is, is that all that we need to, to tackle the issue? So for example, with the model code of conduct that was recently, I think revised, it says, um, there shall be no appeal to caste or communal feelings for securing votes. But a process of Facebook advertising is by design and necessarily an appeal to different kinds of categorizations, whether implied or explicit. And so how does, I don't know, um, how should, uh, how should, I don't know, governance of these kind of advertising platforms be seen 
when these these are some like these kind of biases or something that happens by design. So I guess I will stop with um, the questions of who decides the viewership of particular kinds of political messaging. Should it be necessarily so individuated and isolated and fragmented? And and what is the kind of bigger picture that is missed in in the presence of um, only being seen only seeing content that uh, is optimized for engagement and growth of Facebook? Uh, and, and what does that mean for, um, I don't know, rights to political participation and, and for different kinds of political goals? Um, and I guess the main question of this, the present political advertising transparency framework, that is an outcome of a PR move and like a distraction it, that is something being massively adopted is is that the way to deal with um, these issues? Um, yeah, and this this presentation builds on a body of work developed at AdWatch with my colleague Manuel, who I think is also here. Thanks so much, Nerva. Um, so while we uh, wait for for questions from the audience, uh, obviously the the work that you've done at AdWatch also has looked at kind of international trends in terms of political advertising. Um, could you say a little more about kind of how how they compare with the Indian scenario and what is maybe specific or unique, um, if there are any such features for the Indian context um, as compared to the international context? Right. Um, I think the first thing that comes to mind is that uh, I think three, four years ago, while it was quite um, newly being investigated, like political ads and advertising in general, um, the US banned um, targeting on the basis of race, gender, and a couple of other things for advertisements relating to housing, healthcare, um, social security, I don't know, like two, th three, four things that um, was only implemented in the US, for example. And at that point, these were not even necessarily categorized as political ads. But now you can see in the, I think in the, uh, in the specifications kind of table that Facebook provides that they had to create a separate category called housing and healthcare ads or something like that in order to operationalize this, um, this principle of not uh, discriminating on those characteristics. So I think that, of course, remained right, just applied there. But what I mean to say is that one doesn't need to be limited to the definitions of the categories of the frameworks that are forwarded by the platforms, but can, in fact, kind of go beyond that, I think. Um, but yeah, that's the first one that comes to mind. But mostly also, I think, even across the world, uh, political advertising transparency has been, I think, as far as... Um, as far as, I don't know, regulatory intervention has gone um, within that sense, but I might be mistaken about more recent developments. Um, I was also wondering, I mean, obviously we have a very diverse uh, media environment in India um, and, you know, obviously kind of varying levels of literacy, et cetera. So kind of, there, is there a kind of, you know, say a context collapse or a kind of convergence with the way that these ads kind of travel inside and outside Facebook, right? Like, so you did mention that obviously Facebook's own kind of family of, um, you know, say Instagram, for example, will be places that these advertisements are shared, but also kind of the relationship with things like, you know, kind of TV news, WhatsApp messages, et cetera. Do you have a sense that, you know, these advertisements actually travel outside the kind of Facebook environment, or is there kind of a, a footprint or impact, impact that's possible to maybe not measure, but kind of um, understand as another kind of vector of, of influence maybe? I wouldn't say the Facebook ads necessarily travel out as much as they're part of like the larger fabric of um, mm, propaganda and misinformation. So we know like, for example, that a lot of Twitter trends make it to broadcast TV uh, kind of news. Um, and we have, of course, in the more recent reports seen how these are manipulated and so on. So I guess, um, yeah, also thinking about what Anand was speaking in the previous talk about the focus group discussions to look at what are the kind of optimal targeting uh, narratives to have and so on. So I'm sure all of that goes into creation of these um, mm, 
well, of ad campaigns and so on. Um, so I, I think I definitely see it as part of the larger uh, media landscape that functions, but not, but not necessarily that like Facebook ads on its own have the power to like sway X or Y. And I think kind of um, jumping out from that, there's a question in the chat, which is uh, how do you see political advertisement ecosystems go beyond Facebook into domestic Indian platforms such as ShareChat and Ku? Hmm. That's a great question. I think um, I think there's a platform design only so different with things like shared chat and like you just have like the inroad to it is the the form is not necessarily I think advertising so much as much as what platforms like to call organic reach, which is also algorithmic um, and and not in the trees or something. But um, yeah, I think I think just like system design wise platform design i don't know much about ku but especially mm, there was not so much uh when we also looked at church briefly during the 2019 elections um but it was it was like a totally different kind of landscape and i think the the ways in which it's used is also much more different because facebook has for a while been um working on its advertising infrastructure so that is kind of sophisticated but with share chat there were just different kinds of languages and kind of um user generated content that then traveled a lot depending on people that picked it up so there's of course also that kind of uh, crowd source in a way uh, narratives that come up so i don't know how to compare the two and i don't think political ads uh in that sense exist on different platforms i think who who is itself an initiative to an extent that comes with mm, comes with its own kind of leanings, and, and that can be said of Facebook too. But I just mean to say that I think I find it a bit difficult to apply this kind of political ads framework in its uh, crystallized way across platforms. Right. Yes, that makes sense. Um, so I was also wondering: is there a kind of an imbrication of misinformation slash disinformation and political advertising like is there a way in which i mean legislatively or otherwise i mean we, we really don't have any safeguards but um can can one be flagged up as misinformation or disinformation where, where is that kind of kind of diagram i think some years back that was the big debate about whether um like misinformation or disinformation that is part of political speech should be censored by platforms and i think facebook took the um one extreme of saying we will allow it and i think I, I don't recall exactly who it was but i think there was very much a very prominent case in india also many places of um political speech containing lots of misinformation um but yeah i think i think there also I, the responses have been very much about content moderation centric which is again a distraction from more um, i guess algorithmic kind of models and what kind of responses they need. So it, it again becomes this question of takedowns and, and then about like, how do you spot these kinds of uh, speech? And it becomes a very um, uh, systems or like a very, it's, the, it's a computer problem kind of a, it's a computer solution kind of a problem. Um, yeah, I guess that's all I have to say about that. Right, and oh, and we have a question uh, from uh, Gia. Uh, do you have a sense of the scale at which political advertising in India is managing to bypass FP's categorization of being marked as a political ad? And what would an ad like that look like? So are these, for example, more likely to contain questionable content, misinformation or disinformation? I think this goes back to what you were saying early in the talk that you know, something might not explicitly present itself as a political ad, but it's, it is political and what it is trying to achieve? Right, that's a great question. I think the problem, uh, yeah, they definitely um, do not have a sense of the scale, but have a sense that it exists. But it also depends what one would ourselves consider political ads. So of course, there is um, a lot of advertising that falls outside of uh, the categorization, but we don't, we are not able to measure that because that is not part of transparency data. So we're only able to 
anecdotally look at that within the um, the graphical ad library interface, which does not allow for more like systematic kind of understanding. Mm -hmm. But um, but yeah, for example, I think it's quite common for 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 example, like even Ku is a big advertiser, I think, on Facebook very often, and and. Mm, and yeah, it's just like lots of funny things happen. And my colleague had discovered this, that uh, Modi uh, heaters, that keeps coming into political ads, right? Like the ad about this um, very old kind of uh, geezer, geezer, sorry, not heater. Um, and, and but like so much else kind of falls off the map, um, but it's not, it's really, I don't know. I think there needs to be some kind of subversive method to, understand the scale of things which was which i think was possible because it, with um understanding what is the number of political ads in total in facebook because of the statement by zuckerberg but otherwise i think um i don't know what the scale is but it, it definitely is pretty massive Right. I think we also have an, uh, an observation um, regarding and WhatsApp's uh, relationship to Facebook and WhatsApp's entry into digital payments via UPI lets them have access to real names, which are used in bank accounts, which are also the same from Aadhaar slash Epic. So Meta's, Meta's and Facebook's um, kind of uh, parent company, Meta's cap capability after voter ID, UID thing increases. Um, so I think there's obviously a kind of relationship there, and I wonder, you know, whether that also feeds into the data of, um, you know, Facebook's own kind of tar targeting as well. Hmm. I think um, um, in the API where you can um, look for different publisher platforms, there is uh, there is also WhatsApp, but of course it doesn't throw up any results. But at least infrastructurally, it is possible, or or it is kind of envisioned, or I don't know how we want to interpret it. But um, WhatsApp is also kind of envisioned as a publisher platform for ads at some point, or like so. Yeah, I'm sure there are other things there happening with data sharing, but uh, that's that's the concrete thing we know that it's part of some back-end infrastructure. Right, great. Thank you so much. Um, we have another question, which is, uh, if Facebook is categorizing a lesser number of ads as political, does it run the risk of running into uh, some kind of accountability tangle, running with the law or the new social media intermediary guidelines? Um, as far as I know, with the intermediary guidelines, I don't think it um necessitate, necessitates um political advertising transparency uh, but i'm also not that conversant with it so i'm not sure uh but i think facebook is um i i think it's definitely in its benefit to classify fewer as uh political ads both because it wouldn't have to be transparent about the rest of it as well as any problems that might come within the data that is then revealed about these ads yeah, uh, and I think this will be our last question. Um, would political ad making qualify as gig work, which would make the relationship between Facebook and other platforms and the government requiring reinterpretation? I don't know. I mean, I don't think so because uh, political ads typically like a lot of these uh, content marketing uh, firms do it. And I don't think it happens as gig work because it is it does require um, I mean, it's not itinerant and it, I, I don't think like it works in the same way as gig work. Um, that's just my sense though. I, 